to our intro slide. Okay, there's the beginning of the recording. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm Rob Busack. This is the story of the Bacon Hagen Blum Traverse, a trip that I took as a party of four in late July of last year, 2021. Um, so let's once again, if you want to follow along at home, here's some instructions. There's the Caltapo link. Uh, it's a bit more complicated to do it on Google Earth, but you know, do whatever makes you happy there. And so let's get into the details. So um, big picture, this is a multi-day traverse. It's basically backpacking for mountaineers, uh, but it does involve a lot of scrambling and bushwhacking. Uh, we did it as a four day trip, uh, three nights, uh, if I were to do it again, and I kind of do want to do it again at some point, uh, I would do it as a five day trip with four nights, um, just to give us a little bit more time to enjoy being out there, and also more time for summiting peaks along the way. Um, the technical crux of the route is really just basic glacier and there's not even that much glacier travel so uh this is a very accessible thing any basic grad uh could self-organize uh if they're comfortable with the route finding um and the scrambling and the bushwhacking i can at least help you with the route finding part uh the stats may be a little bit misleading um the 21 miles and 10,000 feet uh, it actually takes quite a bit longer than what that sounds like just because of the scrambling and the bushwhacking. Um, and since it is a traverse from point to point, it does require a car shuttle, but it's one of the easier ones to set up with only an hour and 15 minutes between the two different trailheads. Uh, and there is a very strong motivation to start at the south trailhead and end at the north since the south is at 4300 feet and the north is at 700 feet. So you're definitely going downhill more than uphill if you go south to north. Um, and of course, do the right things with permits. Uh, it does require permits in three different zones, but those are pretty underutilized zones, so they should be relatively easy to get. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, we did this in uh, late July last summer. Uh, we were a party of four, myself, Jessica, Evan, and Michelle. Um, and the origin of our plan is that we really wanted to do the ptarmigan traverse. I've done the ptarmigan traverse before and it's wonderful, but my other four climbing friends or my other three hadn't done it yet. Um, however, in late 2020, there was a fire in the Downey Creek area uh, that prompted this closure that lasted over the entire summer of 2021 through October. And we were really hesitant, especially with the like, don't be on the road part. Didn't quite seem like we could get away with parking a car for a week in a car shuttle situation um, on a road that had some official closure order. So instead, we did some internet research and um, I think it was Evan and Michelle found Trail Cat Jim's website with these lovely photos of the bacon tarns, these beautiful high alpine little ponds. And we're like, yeah, let's check this out instead. So where is this in the state? Um, so everybody knows Baker and Shuxon up in Northern Washington, uh, the edge of the North Cascades. This is actually very close to the, the picket range. Uh, and so if you can think of, of Bellingham and then Burlington, and everybody knows Highway 20, um, driving to the east. If you come out of Burlington on Highway 20, there's eventually a turnoff for the Baker Lake Road, which you can follow along this western and northern shore of Baker Lake to that northern uh, lower trailhead here. And then you can leave one car and drive back down around the southern end of Baker Lake. There's a dam that you drive across here and then dirt roads up through the mountains to get to that higher elevation southern trailhead. And then here's the path of our traverse with the three summits roughly pointed out. All right, and since we're talking about summits, um, <laughs> did we summit the peaks? Well, we only summited Bacon. We got really close to summiting Hagen. We'll talk more about that in a bit. And then Blum, we were just kind of out of time, which is why I was suggesting if I did it again, I would do a five day trip rather than a four day trip. So uh, what does it require for this? Um, in terms of gear, I was mentioning it's essentially a basic glacier uh, climb. I would bring 
really light glacier gear. You're not on glaciers that much. You are on a lot more snow fields. Um, and it's just, of course, nice to have a lighter pack. So yeah, like if you have them, aluminum ice axe, aluminum crampons, totally welcome. Keep your glacier travel set up fairly minimal. We had um, a 40 meter, eight millimeter rope. Um, I would probably even bring shorter uh, next time, like you're not using it much. Uh, we had two pickets and one 20 centimeter screw just in case. Could potentially even just bring one picket and make sure that person is in the back on the line because um, you're not on crevasse terrain that much. Uh, I did feel happy having the one 20 centimeter screw just for um, peace of mind because there was some bare ice showing in some places. Um, since it's a multi-day traverse, there's always the fun uh, food planning aspect. And so we had our spreadsheet, which I'll bounce over to for a second here. Uh, so we made this, this spreadsheet that worked out like, okay, if it's going to be four days and I want to target 3,000 calories, like how many am I going to need overall? And then if I start entering all the things that I have, and then it does some math to figure out, okay, like how many calories have I actually packed? And so we worked out all of that. Um, and I found that what I actually ate was um, 12,300 or roughly 3,100 calories per day uh, during the trip. Um, poop options at the campsites. Uh, two out of the three places we stayed were low elevation in the forest and like burying uh, in the forest duff was totally an option. Um, oh, I'm noticing that there's comments in the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, I will share some of these things afterwards. Sorry, I'm not entirely paying attention to the chat while I'm, I'm rambling along. But anyway, back to the poop situation. Do bring some blue bags because at least one camp is going to be high alpine where there is no possibility of burying. So pack out your business. Um, and food storage really kind of mirrors the above situation. If we were down in the forest, there were plenty of trees to hang from, but there was at least one high alpine camp where there was no hanging option. Um, we were fine, <laughs> like just sort of leaving our food out with maybe some rocks on it, but um, a critter proof bag could be a good idea in the future. Some other gear that was rather crucial to our trip. Um, so since we went in late July, mosquitoes were super bad. So the bug head nut was critical. Having a sun shirt that covers up everything the bug head net does not was also really nice. And the hat brim holds the bug net off the, the face. Um, not required, but a really nice thing we had are these Katadin uh, B free squeeze bottles that have the filter like right in the, the mouthpiece, um, which allowed us to like fill up at tons of sort of on the go water spots. Um, and then we had a gravity filter for camp for, for bigger water filtering. Um, one shared canister stove worked pretty well. Uh, I didn't keep notes on fuel, but I'm pretty sure it was two medium canisters that we used for four people in four days. And that was doing hot dinners and hot breakfasts. Um, and then footwear, um, you're doing a lot of scrambling and, you know, rocks, bushwhacking and snow fields. Um, some just nice light duty mountaineering boots for the summer months would be great, or you could even get away with sturdy hiking boots. Um, yeah, and then tiny nice to have, not really necessary, but like some leather gardening gloves were kind of nice for some of the bushwhacking sections. All right, so now I'm going to go through day by day. And for each day, I'm going to start with sort of an overview map of what that day was. Then I'll show you some pictures that show the route for that day. And we'll end the day with sort of a time summary of like how long it took us. So day one, if you recall, place the car shuttle and then arrive at the, uh, the 4,300 foot trailhead. This is the Watson Lakes on uh, Anderson Butte trailhead. And it starts on really nice, beautiful WTA trail uh, through meadows and high forest and then crosses on the the western and northern sides of Watson Lakes and still really well defined trail until you round the end of the last lake and you start gaining elevation up high into this subalpine post glacial section of Mount Watson and then there's a high traverse through that post glacial 
area that's really quite beautiful um, with two little route finding points, but they're fairly obvious even once you're out there, like a ridge to get by here and a saddle to find here. And then after that, there's a descent to the Diabsud Lakes, which is where we camped for the night. So going through that, yeah, starting at the first trailhead, gotta love these really nice, well-maintained WTA trails with their beautiful signs and boardwalk trails and easy hiking through meadows. And then we're seeing the Watson Lakes here where that trail goes through the forest on the northern and western sides and eventually hooks around the northern end of the second Watson Lake and goes up this forested ridge line here until that forest really fades away. And so you can see in this last photo, this is looking up this ridge line into where the forest fades away and also the trail goes from trail to not trail uh, and you're just in that high alpine country. By the way, in this photo we are looking to the east and this is Bacon Peak out here seeing our summit objective of the, uh, the day ahead. So Recapping that from a different viewpoint, uh, there's that nice WTA trail that goes by the Watson Lakes, swings north around the second Watson Lake and goes up through the trees into that high uh, alpine post-glacial area of Mount Watson, passes one rock ridge and then finds a particular saddle. And then from there, we've got the descent to Diabsud Lakes and our first camp is at Diabsud Lakes. So um, I really enjoyed especially the scramble, uh, that high Watson Traverse, because you're up here, you've got this beautiful view of bacon. Uh, there's all these little like snow melt pools with like all sorts of colors, the blue of the snow, some red from watermelon snow. You've got Shuxon in the background. It's quite scrambly, uh, but it really is gorgeous the whole way. And so the first little route finding part is fairly obvious. You get around this rock ridge in sort of the only way that makes sense. Um, and then the second route finding bit is finding this one particular saddle at 5,400 feet. But again, that's fairly intuitive. If you went out there without this beta, those are the places you would just naturally go. So once we get to this saddle and we're standing up in here and we look down on the other side so now we're standing in this saddle and we can see you can see just a little bit of blue right here that is one of the diab sud lakes that we need to get down to and um always the the shortest path between two points is a straight line and so i was looking for sort of like what would be the straight line from this saddle to the lake and so this is kind of the straight line and also looking at the slope angle map it did look like there was a low angle way to go um, here where it wasn't too darkly shaded that would give us access straight down to the lakes however this turned into be uh, a bit of a, a stream area with um, water running on rocks that were slippery and collapsing snow and the scrambling was way more trouble than it was worth. Uh, so in hindsight, we would have been better to do more distance and make this big arc around to the south, this blue line here, which is this same blue line here uh, around on heather benches that circles around to arrive at the pair of Diabsud Lakes. And so this second lower Diabsud Lake is where we ended up camping, sort of right where the red line ends there. And so yeah, here's that second Diabsud Lake and there's our camp for the night and also a preview of what's going to happen the next day. Um, so yeah, to recap, day one, um, placing the car shuttle, it's just a two hour and 15 minute drive from Seattle to the North Trailhead and then an hour and 15 minutes back to the um, South Trailhead where you want to start from. So three and a half hours total driving. I've certainly done a lot worse. That actually felt fairly luxurious compared to most. Uh, the stats for the day, as with every day, uh, the day felt much bigger than these stats kind of implied, um, but it took us seven hours, which I think also was a really good thing considering three and a half hours were spent on car placement. Um, super easy cruising along those WTA trails and also cruising past Watson Lakes. 
The high traverse on the side of Watson was beautiful, but since it's more scrambly, definitely takes a bit longer. And then it took us kind of a while to descend to Diabsid Lakes because of that little creek canyon route finding issue. All right, so far so good on day one. Day two, uh, so from our camp at Diabsid Lakes, we, um, Actually, to pause here, there's there's two options. If you if you read Fred Becky's Cascade Alpine Guide, he actually recommends going east and traversing here to get out onto the south flanks of Bacon and then come up from there. Um, but it did mention a few scramble steps, and we thought it might be less scrambly if we went north. I get the feeling that both routes are probably six one way, half dozen the other. They both have their own little complications. They both get you to bacon eventually. And I actually kind of liked ours. So from our camp goes up to the top of this ridge, that's bushwhacky, then down on the other side of the ridge, that's also bushwhacky, but it clears up in the valley bottom. And then we arc around the valley on snow and talus and meadow to uh, this sort of an interesting bowl high in the valley here that could be a camp spot if you wanted to break things up differently. We circled around further to get on top of Bacon Peak and then descended a different way off of Bacon Peak. You cross this east-west rock ridge here that you can just step through. Um, but then on the other side, you're on the Green Lake Glacier, which is the one glacier we actually roped up for on this. And pretty quickly you descend to a collection of little lakes called Bacon Tarns here that are really beautiful. Um, but then <laughs> there's still kind of a long way to go to the final camp. And there's these two more humps that we have to go over that gained more elevation than we would have liked. So let's break that down a little bit better. Okay, so from our first camp at the Diabsid Lake, um, punch through the forest here, go up this slope, and then get into the, the really bushwhacky forest to get up onto the, the saddle up above Diabsud Lake. And then, um, yeah, referencing this picture from before, remember we had been at Diabsid Lakes, we made it to the saddle, and now we're going to do the descent uh, through the forest on the other side until ironically at the very bottom is where it gets clear. Uh, so this is going up to the saddle. Um, the, the way up was meadow, but it was quite steep to the point where we're still pulling on plants to, to really feel comfortable with the scramble and gets a bit thick in the forest. This is uh, standing in that, that saddle on top of the ridge and looking down at the next bushwhack ahead, which is even bushwhackier. Um, but it's all part of the adventure on this one. And then finally at the base of this bushwhack, we finally got onto a talus field where it's open. And um, from this talus field, if you remember this tongue of snow for a minute, and then also keep in mind this finger of talus going up to the side, you can see that same tongue of snow here and that finger of talus going up to the side. So we're down at the bottom and the route goes up the talus field. Uh, talus or snow, take your choice, but eventually you're on talus here. It gets rather steep going up here uh, and the talus is loose. So it's a little bit slow going, but cross the meadow, get to that interesting bowl that could be used as another camp location. But then there's even more talus and meadow slopes going uphill until finally up here, we're getting on a small lobe of Bacon Peaks uh, Diabsud Glacier. The Diabsud Glacier is more in the background that we can't see on the other side of Baker, Bacon Peak. You can see like hints of the Diabsud Glacier here, hint of the Diabsud Glacier there. It's more on the opposite side. And then also just to mention, there's the Noisy Creek Glacier um, off in this like left of the, <laughs> you see a tiny bit of it there. Anyway, continuing onward. Um, so yeah, here we are going up that meadow with some of the like loose talus. It gets rather steep. We did briefly get to spot a bear cub in this meadow, but he was real quick to run away from us and too fast for me to get a picture of, unfortunately. Um, but then this is that uh, high hanging bowl that's most of the way up. Uh, it's got a nice big flat snow field. This huge water runoff that's a great refill. We're refilling our <laughs> Katadin bee freeze again, keep squeezing in the water, but then there's more uh, ascending rocky slopes and meadows. And after we go up this, 
then we get to the next um now we're actually touching that like slight part of the the diabsud glacier and this is where we we opted to put on harnesses but not rope up because we could see that there were no like we could see at least the glacier ahead of us to the summit really well and we could see that there were no significant crevasse hazards especially since we could see some bare ice we had a lot of confidence that there wasn't like any you know snow hidden crevasses um but anyway to be the right balance of caution we decided if we just put harnesses on but kept the rope in the pack like we would at least be more prepared if we needed to rope up um in the near future so yeah uh pretty easy uh ramp up the glacier here on up to the rocky summit of bacon and so here we are on the summit of bacon got this stunning view back at that watson traverse and the watson lakes back there that we had done baker hanging out in the background um there's a little tiny summit register that we signed and there's also amazingly this beautiful clear pool of water amongst the rocks of the summit that was yet another constant water refill for us um so then coming down from the summit of bacon peak now we're going to the northeast you can see the, the picket range we got the the southern pickets with the mcmillan spires and terror out here we got the northern pickets with fury and luna and whatnot out there and we're going northeast in that general direction this is that rock ridge that splits uh bacon peaks glaciers um so we're on the diabsud glacier now and you can see this is a piece of the green the green lake glacier that is just an easy um rock passage through there all right so uh, now we're on the other side this is um looking back w once you pass through that access to the green lake glacier this is the green lake glacier and there is some crevassing through here we didn't rope up initially if i did it again i would rope up i would rope up right at that rock passing um because we did start crossing here then stepped close to a crevasse and was like okay let's actually attach the rope to the harnesses uh, and we stayed roped up um not very long really just until we met these rocks um again and uh once we unroped here we actually could even do some glissades uh down the snow on this side and this is getting us down eventually to the bacon tarns on that north side of bacon peak so here we are on zoomed in close on that green lake glacier you can see some of that crevassing um the first little tarn we came to i thought was really pretty and it's possible that you could like brush off some of the rocks here and this might be a flat enough rock to camp on um if i were to do it again i'd do a five-day plan with the second night maybe camping here um because it would be a higher elevation, it would be better views, and higher elevation also means less mosquitoes. Um, if camping up here doesn't work, you could also go down to the Bacon Tarns, just this whole series of little pools that are really beautiful, views of Shuxon out there. Um, so once you're down at the Bacon Tarns, we're like, in this photo we're coming downhill and then we make a sharp left turn and go as far left as you can here you can see this lake with that like snow splitting in the middle is actually the same as this lake with the snow splitting it in the middle so this is facing that leftward direction that would be the left turn here and so when you start going left you can see at the little top of a tree over here keep going left past the first set of trees we kept going left until just before the first set of trees and it turned out to be not the best place to descend so getting into that from the bacon tarns going well let's call it west now because from the other perspective left looks right here's that first set of trees and we started coming down the meadow uh, that was east of those trees and then we got into this cliffy area which is fine it's like class three and 40 feet tall but still if i could avoid 
doing the class three and just do the easy walk that's over here on the like west side of the trees that would be better and besides there's another cliff that forces you around um, further west anyway so now we're getting back down lower elevations into meadows and trees again and just below the bacon tarns we now are facing the two humps that sit between us and camp. And so there's one hump, the first one is the smaller one, and then these kind of visually blur together in this picture. But the second one is here. Um, first one is the one with all the trees, second one is more barren of trees. And then our camp is in a deep valley after the second hump. And it was pretty late in the day when we got here, this felt like a really long day. So having to go over these hunt humps that I think gained 300 for the first one and 600 for the second one, but both of them felt way bigger than that. Um, it was more than we really wanted to do at the end of the day. Um, and just to give a sense of just how far those go. So now like looking back uh, south on the route again, again, you saw how we crossed the Green, Green Lake Glacier. We got down to the Bacon Tarns, which is around here. We descended and then we went to, this is the first hump and uh, I as the photographer am standing on the second hump. It's actually quite a long way traversing these um, alpine meadows uh, between the humps. Oh yeah, also small note, this is another place where we should have swung more west for an easier time as opposed to sort of a steep uh, descent that we made that, that seemed more direct um, at first glance. So yeah, here we are going uphill on one of the humps. And here we are going downhill on one of the humps. And here we are taking a break at another little stream we found on the second hump. And you can see in this photo over here that the, the light is beginning to come from the side and get some sunset colors. So we're really pushing up against the sunset hour as we uh, make the last descent to um, our camp at Hidden Lake that night. So Hidden Lake is a lake down here in this valley. It's actually quite low. Um, was that 4,500, I think? Um, and the downside of the low camps, um, certainly it's bushwhacky, but you got to do the bushwhack whether you're like camping there or not. Um, but also being at the lower camps, they had a lot more mosquitoes. And so if I did it again, I would try to pick higher camps. That's another reason for the the maybe five day plan four nights because then you can camp at higher spots it just works out better um so anyway here's our last descent and this this seemed to go on forever with a fair bit of bushwhacking before we finally made it to hidden lake here by the way hidden lake is not actually named hidden lake on the usgs map it is unnamed but it drains into hidden creek so trailcat jim called it hidden lake and we figured we would follow suit so here we are finally at Hidden Lake. Uh, this is to show just sort of how bushwhacky it was in the, the last bit, like pushing past small trees. Uh, the bugs were quite bad. You could see we've got the bug head net on. And then I rather enjoyed this photo where the mosquitoes are actually catching some sunlight. And you can see just how many mosquitoes are swarming poor Evan here. It was definitely the case at both of our, our lower elevation lake campsites. Um, but yeah, so to recap, day two, um, it's actually a fair bit of up and down, uh, <laughs> taking us back down to almost the same elevation we started with. Uh, if you recall, it was that bushwhack up from Diabsed Lake uh, to that saddle and bushwhack down the other side till it finally got clear. Then um, there was that bowl sort of midway up the way to Bacon. And then uh, the remainder of the way to the summit, um, we spent 30 meters, or sorry, 30 minutes hanging out on the summit, lounging and enjoying the views, signing the register, filling up our waters. Um, and then it only took two hours to get down to the bacon tarns from there, but a whole three hours to go over the darn unnamed humps all the way to Hidden Lake. Um, which really, really stretched out the day. On these multi-day traverses, I really prefer it if days are overall less than 12 hours because you're going day after day after day, like a weekend trip, totally fine to do 12 hours or you know much longer, 14 or 16 hour days if it's just like one day on a weekend. But when you're going every day, do plans that 
that end up being under 12 hours <laughs> of moving time per day. All right, so on to the third of our fourth days from our Hidden Lake camp. Um, we're going to ascend again, first bushwhacky, then getting uh, a little bit more alpine onto talus fields. And it circles around and goes up this valley to a uh, coal that Becky describes. Uh, and then we get the interesting situation with Hagen Mountain, where it's got like so many things marked as a summit. And there's definitely contention as which one is the summit. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, but after you do whatever you're going to do at Hagen, um, continue north. And then it gets quite scrambly here, where you like switch over the ridge line to the other side, and you travel on the east facing side. And then you switch back, and you travel on the west facing side. And then you're actually on top of the ridge line. And then finally, in theory, you get to this um, saddle before Mount Blum and could continue up to the summit of Mount Blum. But honestly, it was just way too much to do all in one day. So we took a shortcut down to what would be our Camp 3 at a tarn um, amongst the Blum lakes. So let's get into the details. OK, so this is a photo from day two. Remember that um, our Camp 2 is down here at Hidden Lake. And first, we start through the forest. Um, and there's some scrambly bits and bushwhacky bits until it eventually gets alpine and curves around this nice talus field and up a valley to access Hagen. So here we are scrambling up from Hidden Lake. Um, and it's quite bushy. And then the worst part is, is there's these surprise cliffs in the forest that we had no idea were going to be there. Uh, and you definitely have to do some puzzling. You just kind of want to, the, the cliffs run pretty far uh, side to side. So you kind of just have to pick the most scrambleable part. And we could generally find a section to get through that was like class two or maybe like briefly class three. They weren't too bad. They just were yet another thing that slowed things down. Um, but eventually, with enough scrambling, we got up to uh, things that were getting to be a little bit more meadowy. And then finally, out on the open talus, which felt quite nice. And you can see this talus field here that curves around. We'll see that again. Yeah, so now, picture from very far away looking down at all of this. This is that talus field that curves around. Um, and then goes up this valley behind here to a coal um, on the side of Hagen. All right, so here we are going up that valley to that coal. And once we get up into this coal, uh, so here's the last little bit of like ascending. Let me jump back for a second. So snow is easy. This rocky bit is steep and loose enough that it's just annoying. Um, I mean, it's still just walking or maybe class two, but it is a bunch of loose rock. And so it's always annoying going up steep, loose rock. Uh, but anyway, here, here we are topping out on the loose rock. And then if we rotate the camera and face the other way, facing north again, this is that western glacier of Hagen that we've just stepped onto by crossing through that coal. And you want to go around what I call the summit of Hagen, um, curve around and go up right to get up higher. And now this photo is again <laughs> flipping around again, looking south now back at what I believe is the true summit of Hagen and the snow ramp up to this notch. Also, we found a curiosity, this like mushroom of snow just in the middle of the glacier that was kind of bizarre to find. So uh, yeah, what is the true summit of Hagen? So I've got two different maps here, um, a topo map that I frequently use for planning that marks this as Hagen Mountain, also marks that as Hagen Mountain, and then calls this Hagen Mountain Middle and Hagen Mountain North. But I believe that this red dot here is the actual summit. And we scrambled really close, but didn't quite get there. Um, so comparing that to a USGS map, that's even more interesting because they just take the out and write Hagen Mountain sort of across everything. Um, also, they label it again, maybe for this peak that is that same peak. But anyway, um, 
from the topo lines, it's pretty clear that this is the area of interest. This is the, the only area where we have the 7,000 foot topo line. And while it's very interesting that they show more topo lines on the eastern half here, I'm quite confident that the western end is the higher point and that the topo lines are just wrong here. And to, to uh, confirm my suspicion, let's go to Becky. Uh, so Becky uh, describes in the Cascade Alpine Guide, um, Mount Hagen, there are three main summits of similar height with the southwest one being the true summit. And so I agree with Becky that those topo lines, if we jump back for a second here, this 7,000 foot topo circles both of these peaks, or actually maybe I should show it here, both of these peaks. It circles the south peak. And um, get my directions correct here. This is the western one. And this is the Eastern one. And I'm quite sure that the Western one is the higher of the two. Um, annoyingly, Becky describes this as class three, but what we encountered was definitely not class three. <laughs> um, so we dropped our packs, which was regrettable. Uh, we left ropes and harnesses with the packs and just took an ice axe and scrambled up to that notch. Sorry, I'm going to jump back for a second here. Oops. Yeah, we are scrambling up to that notch right there from this side. So the perspective is the same um, when we're coming up on this. Uh, and we did scramble up to the notch. But here, when we passed through the notch and looked on the other side, this was the rock I was looking up at at the summit, and it was steep and not the most secure holds. It probably still was just like class four, but if we look down at the same spot, you can see that there is a really long fall distance. It would have been a hundred, couple hundred feet fall, uh, which would have definitely been fatal if you had peeled off at any point here. So in my opinion, this should be something you use the rope for just in case, even if it maybe is a scramble. Um, and so we decided not to risk it, not to scramble up to the summit because we had left the rope in the pack. Um, if we had had the rope up there with us, I probably would have had Jessica belay me and sling some blocks and probably would have gone just fine. Um, but yeah, if I did it again, bring the rope all the way up to the summit. Um, we felt that it took too much time to return to the packs to retrieve the rope and come back up there again. We just needed to move forward with our day. So it was over. We got really close. But that said, a lot of other trip reports talk about quote unquote summiting Hagen. And I'm pretty sure they've actually climbed one of these other things that wasn't even the true summit in the first place. So in some ways, we got closer than most people, I think. Okay, moving forward again. Finally, when we leave the summit of Hagen, uh, we're walking north on that western glacier um, past those middle and north peaks. And there's a little uh, rocky pass here, zoomed in close on the rocky pass here. This is what we're looking for. It is the, the, the natural place the terrain takes you to. Uh, none of the route finding here is that hard. I'm just giving you guys lots of detail. Um, and then on the other side, once you like hop over this, it is briefly steep and quite loose in an annoying way, but it does have sort of a nice cave to the side of it where people can stand and be out of the way of rockfall. And it's pretty flat snow at the bottom, so it's totally fine scrambling down the steep bit. Um, but once you've scrambled down that steep bit and you're looking north again, things look a little bit wild because now um, this looks so steep when you first see it, but you know that it's like where your route needs to go to get back on top of the ridge line. Turns out it is indeed class three. This is what it looks like when you get up close to it. Um, and it's very manageable. Um, and then as we got higher and got close to the snow, you can see that Jessica is using one hand on the rock and one ice axe uh, on the snow for scramble stability. And eventually we get more 
into the rock and snow up here to the point where there's this wild deep moat on the upper side of the snowpack. It's probably 10 feet deep, at least like twice our height um, being in this moat that we were able to walk through between the, the rock and the snow. Problem is, is that we don't want to be in the moat, we want to be up on top. And so that led to all sorts of fun, where we got to do some fun stemming moves between snow and rock uh, to climb the moat um, to, to get ourselves up on top of the snow and up on top of the ridge line. Uh, this was, I think, probably the most fun bit of the whole traverse. It was um, just a really interesting little <laughs> scramble problem to solve um, and such a cool thing to, to get to take pictures of. Uh, so finally, once we do get up on the ridge line uh, that that was all accessing, there is um, someone's built a rock wall here and there is a fairly large dirt ring that could probably fit two tents. This could potentially be a campsite. And if I did the trip again uh, as a five day trip, this would be camp three, I think. Um, it does mean that you would have to melt snow for your water access or let's back up a second here. I go do do do. Yeah, before doing this scramble, there is a really nice water source down here. Fill up as much as you can and carry it up. You're not going to want to scramble back down later to get any more if you camp on top of the ridge line up here. Uh, but you could car carry at least, you know, all of your containers full up the scramble. Okay, so back on top of the ridge. There is this viable um, campsite if you want it. And now we, we actually get up on the ridge line itself and walk right on the crest of the ridge, proceeding north towards Mount Blum. So this is on top of that ridge line. Now looking back, you can see what we've come from. Again, we've got the, the summit of Hagen here. These two points together being the south summit, the western one and the eastern one. Uh, we had scrambled to the coal between the two, but no further. We had crossed the snow. This is where that brief, steep, rocky descent was. Then down a snow field, there was that water source. And then we really can't see that scramble up and that like cool moat move was right about here. And then those camp, that one campsite that could probably fit two tents is on the ridge right here. So then, yeah, easy walking on the snow to get on top of the ridge line. And then we're doing this beautiful ridge walk. Uh, it eventually gets to a bit where we go downhill on some snow. Kind of cool that we always have Baker. And then off to the right we, out of the photo is Shuxon. You've got these constant views of Baker and Shuxon the whole way. And we also get to see Baker Lake and see that we're really getting towards the northern end of it. We've made some progress on our traverse. So uh, after this snow descent, uh, we are facing Mount Blum itself. You get to sort of a rocky low point and you could continue scrambling up Blum. But for us, it was beginning to get kind of late in the day. It was like 4 p.m. because we had come all the way from Hidden Lake and taken the time to try to, to scramble Hagen, plus all the like scramble things um, after Hagen. Um, so we did proceed a little bit here, but then we uh, decided to come back and descend this snow field here that gets us down to below Blum and then off to Looker's Left for eventually where we camped. But just to mention one other cool feature, there is this, this rock right here is actually surprisingly flat. I've been calling it the, the granite countertop, you could totally pitch a tent um, on top of that and use some other rocks to like in place of stakes. Um, this could also be an interesting nifty place to camp. Um, I jokingly call it the granite countertop, but to be factually correct, uh, I think it's like Chilliwack, uh, I forget the name of the rock. Becky has it in the Becky guide, but it is something not granite. Um, Right, so that snowfield that we descended, this gets a bit steep and firm. We were glad, I think, to have crampons through some of this, scrambling the rock, and then eventually it gets down to the, to, this is a bowl here with a drainage, and there is meltwater running down that we are paralleling towards the upper Blum Lake. Oh, and, and while we're here, just looking ahead, you can see the frozen 
Upper Blum Lake, and then just past it is this little tiny um, tarn that is unnamed, and we've been calling just the Upper Blum Tarn. And this was stunningly beautiful, and it's where we eventually camp at the end of this day. Um, so anyway, yeah, down the snowfield, we've made it to where this rocky bit is following the stream. And so here's close up on the rocky bit following the stream. This part gets rather loose and uh, is an annoying down scramble as well. I'm actually going to call this the the safety crux of the whole traverse, at least our route. Um, it was steep enough with enough loose rock that this was the only place where I was like actually worried for anyone's safety, but we moved really carefully, uh, definitely kicked down a lot of stuff because it's all really loose, but eventually we got everybody through one by one. So yeah, this is where that like loose bit that was really unpleasant is. Eventually we got down far enough that we're now walking around the southern shore of the frozen Upper Blum Lake. And then after we get past Upper Blum, here is that Upper Blum Tarn and more <laughs> granite countertop style Chilliwack rock that uh, becomes our campsite for the night. We actually camped right here. You can see Jessica making the final steps into camp there. Um, and yeah, this was just a wonderful place to be. We were so happy to camp here because it's always more enjoyable to camp in the Alpine and have those views as long as the weather allows for it, which certainly late July does. And the other really key factor is that by being up here, uh, there was much, much less mosquitoes than any of those forest lake camps we had camped at prior to this. So yeah, you're just camping on these perfectly flat rocks, great from a leave no trace standpoint, but also worth carrying some loops of cord uh, that can go around big rocks to replace tent stakes because you're definitely not putting a tent stake in this solid flat rock. Um, but yeah, just a, a really beautiful place to spend the night. And if I did the five day, four night plan, I would definitely camp in this spot again. This would still be my last night of the trip either way. So to recap, day three was another fairly big day with a lot of things uh, that we ended up doing. Um, the bushwhack scramble up from Hidden Lake with those cliffs in the forest took some time. Uh, then the talus was much easier till we got to that coal uh, next to Hagen Peak. We circled around Hagen uh, and then to the uh, notch between the, the two south summits of Hagen. Um, we left our packs, attempted the scramble, but since we didn't have the rope, we ended up turning back on that uh, afterwards, proceeding north um, and descending that scramble bit and then scrambling back out, yada, yada, yada. Eventually, um, at you know, near the end of our day, we were looking at the base of Blum and we knew that it would add many more hours um, to the day if we continued on up to Blum. So instead, we we just aimed straight down to get to Upper Blum Tarn, but even that took us three more hours to descend to, um, given the firm snow and then the uh, the tricky loose scramble next to the, the water runoff. Whew, so that's day three. All right, day four, our last day kind of sad to leave things behind, but even more sad to descend to lower elevations where the shrubbery just gets even denser. So we had our camp at the Upper Blum Tarn, and uh, some people descend a gully here that goes straight to the Upper Blum or this Middle Blum Lake, uh, but this gully looks shitty. I say don't do it. If you bounce over some ridge lines, there's actually a much nicer descent on low angle talus down to the uh, lowest of the Blum Lakes. But then we traverse in the forest um, and across some talus fields. And somewhere around here, uh, the descent gets a lot steeper and uh, the bushwhack gets a lot thicker. It took us a surprisingly amount of, long amount of time to bushwhack down through here till we eventually caught up with trail, 
across a suspension bridge and back to where the uh, car shuttle was parked. So going through that in detail, um, our camp is right behind me and taking this photo. And so there's that not ideal gully that goes straight for uh, that middle Blum Lake. But if it's even better if you bounce over this ridge line and then on the other side, you get this nice talus field that's the, the ideal kind of talus where it's stable, it's not that steep of an angle, and it's really nice to scramble along. Um, and so followed that talus down to the lowest Blum Lake, and then, then you're just sort of following a bearing through the forest that goes off um, and eventually downhill. And at first, like, it's not too bad. You cross some other talus fields in the forest, but then it gets a little bushwhackier and even more bushwhacky and um, being both really steep and really bushwhacky at the same time presents its own challenges. We did now and then see this like evidence of a trail, but it would come and go. We constantly were like finding it and losing it again. And what really stood out to me here is that somebody had notched this log, that there was like trail maintenance halfway through the otherwise terrible bushwhack. Um, so I thought that was was really funny. Um, there is a part of me that kind of wants to go back up here with and do a trail maintenance day and maybe flag some trees and see if it could be improved. But maybe only if I, when I eventually go for doing the, this whole traverse again. So down at the bottom, the, the bushwhacking got as thick as I've ever experienced it. And having done the ptarmigan traverse before, previously that Bachelor Creek um, drainage from the ptarmigan traverse had held the record as the the worst bushwhack I had ever done, but this Bacon Hagen Blum traverse managed to raise the bar and was even thicker, worse bushwhacking. Where it's just like, yeah, I need to go forward through this. Like, what even is the path through this? Um, it got kind of ridiculous at some points, and it took us many hours because you just can't make any speed when you're you're fighting the shrubbery that much but eventually after so long we were so excited to punch out onto this well-maintained wta trail again um and then it was kind of unreal to suddenly be on this man-made suspension bridge um after being so in the wilderness uh and then finally back to the cars um, and so to recap, it took us nine hours from our camp down to the cars. Six of that was doing the darn bushwhack. Um, yeah. And so that is the end for us. Finally at the cars, a little dirty and stinky and just happy to finally change into shoes and um, went to Mount Vernon for some bar that was open that had pizza and beer, which was exactly what we needed at the, the end of a trip like that. Um, yeah. So uh, I've mentioned a few times that if I went back, I would do it as a five-day, four-night version, mostly because I want to be able to get those summits of Hagen and Blum. Um, and it's much nicer if you can have these sorts of traverses, keep all the like days moving times, 12 hours or less. Um, so if you did it as five days, um, this is this is my thought. Same first campsite, Diabsid Lakes. Um, second campsite would be earlier before having to do those two unnamed humps. Um, camp high at, at either the tarn before Bacon Tarns or Bacon Tarns themselves. You'd have to figure some things out because both of these were pretty rocky and it wasn't entirely obvious where a tent would go, but I think you could move some rocks and make it work or just camp on some flat snow next to it. Be aware that this would be well, I guess there's definitely water sources from the tarns, but this would be a blue bag situation. You're certainly not burying any waste up there. Um, and then also breaking things up, that ridge top rock ring, if you remember at that top of just after the wild snow moat move, um, that would be another relatively high elevation campsite. Once again, high elevation means less mosquitoes. This would be way more pleasant than the hidden lake down in the forest. Uh, and then the fourth and final camp, that upper Blum Tarn, again, is just such a fantastic spot. And so if we took our travel times and broke them up differently based on those uh, spots, um, this is what the 
the days would be. Uh, I'm not sure how long it would take to add the Blum Summit, um, but since the moving camp part is only four hours, you certainly have plenty of the day to go do the Blum Summit as well. Um, yeah, and then also wanted to mention that Evan uh, on our trip at the time was working for the Seattle Times and uh, ended up incorporating a lot of it into a Seattle Times article that tragically is tracking just how awful glacial recession has been uh, with global warming. Um, it's a little bit of a devastating read, but you know it's it's good to be aware of. Um, it does also focus a bit on the Noisy Creek Glacier, which is not one that we stepped on during our thing. We we approached um, south, up, up is south here, um, of the Noisy Creek Glacier to get on top of Bacon Peak and then went way around, maybe too far, went around to this coal and crossed the Green Lake Glacier coming down here onto this big shield of a snowfield. Um, and so we often weren't seeing the Noisy Creek Glacier, but if you're looking for it, Becky points it out for us. So yeah, um, in a minute, I'm gonna let each of uh, my traveling companions add their own comments and maybe Evan can comment on the article uh, as well. So uh, at this point, um, Jessica, is there anything you wanna add to, to the adventure? Um, you did such a good job. It was really, really fun to to kind of see this like laid out like this. And I was just having some fond memories and some sad memories. It was a very, very bushwhacky trip, like the most bushwhacky I've ever been on. Um, I don't know, the bushwhack out was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but overall, it was like such a fun trip. And yeah, thanks for presenting it so well. That was really fun. And then Evan and Michelle, uh, what do you guys want to add to the story? Well, you make it sound so pleasant. I, mean, uh... <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> no, the bushwhacking was... is real. <laughs> yeah. It was a very fun trip. Um, and there's... Um, Lots to, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating place. There's some of the lower, lower glaciers, probably the lowest in, um, in the lower 48. So um, it's interesting time to, to see them and, and visit them and we won't have them forever. So visit them soon. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, Rob, you did a great job of, of summarizing and, and getting in all the detail and fun to relive that. Um, there were just such stunning views all the way. Um, so that was definitely a highlight. Getting to camp high up on the last night was really fun. I think a takeaway for me was just the mental load of a traverse like that. Rob mentioned the really long days and just you're, you know, 15 miles back in there and um, kind of each day you're encountering new territory instead of you know you've reached the halfway point and you can kind of relax a little bit so I think just something to keep in mind if for a longer traverse that um cool to get to cover so much ground but definitely the mental the mental load was was high um I think I only cried once when I spilt my bagged um mac and or, mm, tuna noodle cast or some type oh, of bag yeah. meal always seal your your bagged meal when you turn it upside down lest you spill hot <laughs> dehydrated meal all over yourself so i think that those were the only tears <laughs> yeah, the, the trip stats don't match the level of effort on on this one perhaps so just to <laughs> yeah for to sure <laughs> and evan is there anything you want to add on the the seattle times article or i guess you already uh, yeah i mean I, I think the noisy creek glacier is really interesting it's been studied since 1993 so there's a researcher who visits every year and, and takes measurements. It's lost quite a bit of ice at this point, um, but it's a, uh, it's collapsing. Um, so that's not great. Um, but it's a good reminder of, of just how the mountains are changing, I think. Fantastic. All right. And let me share again and we'll take some questions. I guess I didn't really need to share. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Rob. That was a really um, fantastic presentation. Well organized, lots of great photos, lots of great beta, and, and lots of information that folks can use in the future if they should try and enter that same area themselves. Um, there's compliments that are starting to stream in. 
in the um, in, in the chat. So I encourage you to to read through those. Um, and if anyone has a question for Rob, so we'll try a slightly new format here where you uh, declare that in the chat, and then we'll give you a chance to ask. Um, so I see David Enfield has a few comments. Is that right, David? Would you like, do you have a question for Rob? Yeah, so we did this, uh, six of us, uh, all mountaineers, did this as a non-mountaineer trip in 1979, Watson, Bacon, Hagen, and Blum. And Very cool. We, we summited all four, um, but it was a nine-day trip. So we, we, our packs were obviously <laughs> much heavier, 75 pounds at the start. Um, there were, there were a bunch of things in this presentation that were very interesting, um, particularly the amount of rock versus snow. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't, I mean, we had climbing gear, but we didn't, we really didn't use it because the snow was so good. We did that the, the last kind of the overlap week between July and August, so at the same time. Um, and, and it was longer. So we, 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 we camped in noisy creek drainage. Mm. Uh, and that was the worst bushwhacking that we encountered <laughs> was through that drainage um, where you, I've got pictures where you, you can only see the top of somebody's head <laughs> because, because it was so bush brushy. And then we, we so we, we camped more frequently, obviously. Um, we had a great campsite above Green Lake where you, just awesome views, but then we camped down close to Lake Burdine as well. So, so we had more up and down as also. You covered a lot um, more ground than we did too. Yeah, it was well more days. True. <laughs> um, it was interesting on Hagen. I think we were the either the second or third group in the register. The first one was uh, Becky. Wow, that's <laughs> and that so was cool. kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, but but we did we we didn't high camp very often. So like for Blum, we camped at Lower Blum Lakes and then did Blum up and down in one day. Mm. Um, and then finally, where you uh, cross the Baker River, uh, there was no bridge at the time, so we had to ford. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> so we had to ford it, and so we we walked up and down kind of to try to find the shallowest um, area that we could actually afford it. Uh, but we did, you know, it was, it was kind of mid, mid thigh, mid, mid knees, mid thigh. So yeah, it was, it, it, it was just fun to see. First of all, I'd read Evan's article and, and that certainly brought a lot of memories back, but I've also forgotten a lot. So, you know, trying to think about where we camped it's a little more difficult uh, at this and point. But thank you so thank, much. Thank you. It was just a, a, a good uh, memory uh, of a good trip. So, thanks so much for sharing. That's yeah, you're it's welcome. Fascinating to hear the the other experience. Yeah, uh, Carl, we should go to the next person with a question. Do you want to pick? Yeah, one? thank you, uh, David, for uh, it. It's a great story and. So uh, this is a really remote, remote location, but now we know it's climbed at least every 40 years. So um, <laughs> there was a question about whether two wheel drives can get to the trailhead and Jessica responded and said, yes, two wheel yes. drives will get there. Uh, and so the next person with questions, I think is Monica Charpentier. Are you there, Monica? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I like terrible lighting over here. Um, thank you so much for sharing. This was awesome. I have been reading troop reports on Northwest Hikers and Trail Cut Jim's website um, for a couple of years now, trying to put together a similar trip. So it was amazing to hear and see your pictures. Um, I noticed you did not go down to Green or Burdeen. Um, mm. I'm looking to bring pack rafts and do some rafting to cut out some hiking time. Um, is there a reason why you guys didn't plan to get down to those lakes? Anything you would do differently? Pack rafts sound heavy, uh, but They're also could be fun. <laughs> Um, I think that we, did we only have four days to, to do it in? I can't remember exactly what, what our thought process was back when we were I think, planning. I think we were just more focused on the summit. 
And yeah. so going down further to different lakes, like we just didn't care that much about going down to those lakes. I mean, they look beautiful and stunning, but we were also already camping at like multiple lakes. So yeah, we just didn't really prioritize Virgin or Green Lake. We also didn't have the degree of beta that you guys all now have. And it was a lot of mental effort just to like come up with a plan for a couple of days. And so we, I don't think that we did enough research to to figure out how to go to Green Lake or Burdeen, even though it does look like a beautiful area that I would kind of be interested in exploring those further, given future trips and more opportunities. Who's next? Yeah, thank you, right. Monica. Uh, Chris Finley has a question. Chris, are you there? Yeah, I am. Hey, fantastic. Boy, that's got me excited for getting out this summer. Yeah, um, do it. This would, is there any chance the spring would have been better? Would that have helped you at all with, or it still would have been mm. too low for the brush? Yeah, Jessica, you were shaking your head. Do you want to comment on that? I say no on the spring. I don't know. I, I feel like you would run into like, it depends on the snowpack, I guess. But if there was like snow in the bushwhack, I feel like it just would have complicated the some of the bushwhack. Um, and a, a lot of the think. a lot of the bushwhack had enough shrubbery that was tall enough that I I don't think it would be fully buried in snow. I think you'd then just have to do the bushwhack and also deal with snow at the same time, especially yeah. since that northern trailhead does get down to just 700 feet. Um, and I think there's a that, little. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I, th I think there's a little too much bushwhacking for me to suggest doing it as a ski trip. However, somewhere out there on Turns I was Year, just going to say that. That yeah, amazing so trip report. I wish I had the link to share, skis. but search turns all year yeah. yeah someone did an absolutely crazy ski of this route. he did it solo and he did it in like oh there jeff wong has linked it in the chat nice yeah um, that guy was i think he did it impressive. in like two or three days so he must have i can't even imagine carrying my skis out of that bushwhack but it's been done <laughs> a-frame skis and bushwhacks don't go well together uh, for what it's worth, I think some of the glacier researchers go up in uh, the noisy drainage in the spring, um, and that might be an, a way to do it, or get in the same area at least. I've also seen a number of trip reports that go late fall that look beautiful, and that's at least a way to avoid the bugs. Like you don't have the mid-July bugs that we had swarming us at all the lake campsites. Um, so late fall is possibly a good option too. Thank you for, for that. Should, uh, Carl, you want to pick the next question? Uh, oh, sorry, I had one more comment oh, yeah. on the spring. Um, depending on the snowback, I guess you might have problems with the higher road. It may be covered in snow and it just may add additional, like I think the, the person that skied it had to walk some of the like he had to walk the the road up to the trailhead. Um, so it the trailhead just might not be accessible in the spring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, as I said before, lots of uh, compliments and thanks in the chat. Uh, I don't see any anyone uh, declaring they have a question at the moment. If anyone does have a question, do let us know. Yeah, Sabrina, my pack was like 40 pounds at the beginning of this. I can't imagine the 75 pound pack either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that you said that it weighed that much instead. <laughs> the food spreadsheet makes a big difference. Like, like keeping four days of food to just seven pounds. Like it's really easy if you don't track it to like let that weight balloon. Thanks. Any other questions out there? Oh, Patty is asking, Patty, did you want to ask uh, your question? Pat, Patty's asking if you saw anyone else on your trip. And, and we, saw, uh, we saw one other person. Well, I guess, did we? to when? be fair, at the, at the beginning right. of the trip, it was kind of a more common trail. So we did see a few, like a handful of people probably. But after we exited the Watson Lakes area, we saw one person 
Um, I don't know, Rob, if you remember, but we were do, now that just you mentioned near, it. Yeah, we were we were just on the ridge near um, the Diabsid uh, Lakes. There was yes. that Fisher guy. Is that who you're thinking of? Oh, there was a Fisher, and then there was one other person up near Hagen Peak. Um, oh, we did see that one guy. We <laughs> saw <laughs> one solo traveler. We didn't talk to him. He was quite far away from us. But, he was busy um, scrambling one of the not summits of Hagen. Yeah. And I think that he might have been one of the people who was confused as to which was the true summit of Hagen. I feel bad for him pushing all the way up there as a soloist yeah. and then probably going up the wrong peak. Looked like he came up the noisy creek, potentially drainage. Um, yeah, but Patty, basically there was like no one out there. <laughs> It definitely gets a whole lot less traffic than Ptarmigan Traverse. It is it is a lesser done route. And if anything, I, I hesitate to say this about most routes, but I think it could actually benefit from more traffic, like stomp down some of those bushwhack sections. And this could actually be a really stunning uh, traverse and alternative to Ptarmigan. Spread out the crowds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've seen more folks and it sounds like you're describing, you know, going through the, the time again, for sure. So um, I don't think I don't think everyone's aware of, of maybe this trip, but uh, good to compare. Um, <laughs> David, uh, David Belding is another David asks a very important question. Uh, did you eat any bacon on Bacon Peak? Sadly, we did not even pack any bacon, but we really should have. <laughs> Like some dried bacon would have been pretty ideal backpacking food. Okay, any any other questions from from the audience? Okay, well, thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for letting me show you my vacation photos <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> uh, this was fun. Yes, thanks again, Rob. Thanks to you and also to uh, Jessica and Evan and Michelle. Uh, great, great story and great presentation. Um, yeah, and I'll just remind everyone if if you have a tip on a future bait and bruise, do reach out to me if it's your own story or someone else's and, and I'll look into that and happy to uh, set up another presentation. Um, there isn't one listed on the site right now, but I do have plans in the works for April and May presentations that are coming. Um, March remains open, but uh, certainly in April and May, we'll have a few more talks. So with that, um, and again, Rob, lots of thanks streaming through now from everybody. So do, do thank you, that everyone. Later. Yeah, I'm definitely reading those. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh,